My name is Scott Golly. I am currently Vice President and Fire and Building Safety Service Line Leader for Special Hazards. Um, I've been with Jensen Hughes now for a little over 21 years, and I've been in the industry for um, a little over 28 years. So let's talk about fluorine free foam now. You'll hear it referred to as F3 or SFFF, which is synthetic fluorine free foams. But they've been developed, could not meet mil spec. So uh, the military developed the, their, a dedicated specification for fluorine free foams, which is supposed to be MIL, mil spec PRF. 32725 is the test standard that the military is using for accepting or qualifying a foam. There has been early adoption of the fluorine-free foams in Europe, uh, Australia, both um, Copenhagen Airport in 2009 started using the fluorine-free foams. But globally, fluorine-free foam has been in use for quite some time now. We just haven't seen such an aggressive move to get rid of the PFAS until more recently in, in, the, in the past. So there are multiple F3s now available on the marketplace under different listings, not mil PRF but uh, different listings, including UL-162, which there's well over a dozen products there now that are UL listed and can be used in commercial applications. So something to remember, though, is fluorine-free foams are not film forming. They don't produce that surfactant seal on the fuel. So aspiration becomes very critical. The NFPA Research Foundation produced a document called Foam Quality as Primary Driver for F3 Performance, and that was done by Jerry Back. So commercial F3 products use fluorine-free hydrocarbon or uh, sulfonated surfactants, as well as solvents, stabilizers, and thickeners, which dramatically increase the viscosity of the F3 con concentrate. And we'll talk about the complexity of some of these fluorine-free foams. They're not simple products. Right now, limited environmental data to compare F3, uh, since there's no standard test data yet. But from what I have seen, what the industry is leaning towards, it is not environmentally harmless. So I tend to use a little caution when we talk about the applications or replacements for applications of AFFF. I tend to try and lean towards, can we get rid of foam altogether first? And then what can we use in foams if we have to use a foam? And we'll talk more about that as we move forward. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the fluorine-free foams. So fluorine-free foams result, uh, rely heavily on the solvent package to provide a foaming application and then stability under heat. Um, you know, even with AFFF, you needed to have stability with different types of fuels. I mentioned alcohol compatibility uh, versus petroleum-based. The stability of fluorine-free foams is, is a uh, complex chemical mix to make them work, right? So F3s do not produce a film at all. We've already talked about that. And they don't have that positive spreading coefficient across the fuel surface like AFFF had. AFFF, when you, when you learn to apply it in the fire department, they basically tell you to bounce it off a surface in, into the pool fire. And you basically kind of ricochet off a wall or a container. And it, it naturally pushes out over the fuel. Fluorine freeze don't do that as readily. There is some concern about how the uh, fluorine freeze hold up in heat over time during storage. Do they degrade rapidly? But um, not a ton of data out there yet, but there are concerns about its stability over time. But the fluorine-free foams are higher viscosity than AFFF. That doesn't necessarily mean that they need to be adducted at a different aspect ratio, but we'll talk about that moving forward. In fact, some of them even approach non-Newtonian or, or are non-Newtonian fluids, which is really critical when we start talking about methods of pumping it and moving it. So there's ongoing research, right? There are heavy, there's heavy focus on the siloxanes to try and get that performance up and uh, reduce the surface tension, but maintain its, uh, its integrity over a fuel. Um, they do require co-surfactants to increase the stability. And encapsulated ionic liquids in metal carbonate uh, nanoparticles are being used. So these foams are very complex products. Uh, and we'll talk more as we move forward. One of your best resources, to some degree, may be some of the manufacturers. But And then they include flame retardants in the formulations so that you get multi-mode extinguishment. All right, so what are our resources when we look at, at designing fluorine-free foams? We have NFPA 11, which is the standard for low and medium and high expansion foams. NFPA 16 and NFPA 11, NFPA 16 merged. NFPA 30, flammable combustible liquid code. NFPA 409, the big 
reference for aircraft hangars, and UL-162 is uh, readily available for um, the listing of commercial products. So just because it's listed in 162, though, does not mean it meets mil spec. Some of the, the criteria you may want to pull in, UF, uh, UFC pulls in 409. But what's interesting in the industry is the push both Air Force and Navy are two big consumers of AFFF or historically have been. And their push seems to be trying to get more towards water-based as well, right? So there's an aircraft Air Force technical engineering letter that's out, uh, 0215 is probably the, the most applicable, and um, 86.8. So when you look at these, these different standards, understand that um, everybody in the industry is still talking about how we use fluorine-free versus the AFFF, and are there better alternatives? And we'll talk about that as we move forward. Okay, so what are some of the considerations we need to take into account when we look at fluorine-free foam? So working on this at several facilities right now with Jensen Hughes um, and helping uh, uh, several other engineers that I'm aware of that are working on uh, several facilities doing this right now. So getting a lot of calls for how do we get rid of our AFFF product? And why is that? A lot of states are saying you cannot use it anymore. You cannot discharge it. You can't, um, there are even states that say you can't, you can't have it after a certain time. Admittedly, I don't have a, a ready, readily available list of that, but the um, ITRC website does list those, and it's a great resource if you're not sure. For example, I'm doing a big project in Ohio right now. They don't really have a lot of, really the only standard they've put in is uh, we don't want you discharging it for training, uh, and that's about it. So it it varies pretty dramatically across the United States. Um, internationally, probably a little more advanced in just don't use it. But when we look at these projects, the removal and remediation is complex and critical, and it can be costly. So make sure if you're, if, especially if you're being asked to do a rough order magnitude cost estimate, make sure you're taking into account that remediation component. Remediation is a little tough to get a handle on cost for. All right. And then uh, F3 or SFF and AFFF work very differently. We've talked about that. And you need bubbles. With the F3, it doesn't have that film. So without that film, it needs to be uh, aspirated well. AFFF is effective uh, due to that film, and F3 completely loses it. System assessment by a professional is wise, and that's why we're starting to get calls uh, to assess these systems and uh, assist clients with replacing them. There's impairment plans, you know, though we've been contacted to develop impairment plans for large aircraft hangars where the state says you've got to get rid of your AFFF, or the insurance carrier says you've got to get rid of your AFFF. But there's no rapid drop in solution or the cost is something we need to account for. So impairment plans are, are becoming uh, a, a more common ask as well by our clients. So, again, I, I do kind of want to reiterate there. We don't know that F3s are environmentally friendly. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I like Jerry's phrase. He basically says if it bubbles, it kills fish. So when you're using the fluorine free foam, look at alternatives, too. If, if we can do our client justice by recommending a product that works as well, but avoids this same discussion in eight years or 10 years or 15 years, I would rather do that, right? So we're, we're having that same thought process around clean agents. You know, should we be using Novec? Well, maybe we should be looking at water mist more, things like that, right? Where the industry is focusing on truly environmentally friendly solutions. All right. So when we look at the um, aircraft rescue and firefighting vehicles, this is a good example where we've seen a lot of the clean out and remediation efforts. The fluorine components are very persistent. And um, what my, I'm understanding from our environmental team is that it deposits on different surfaces and builds up. So multiple rinses are required, but every rinse needs to be contained. So you're containing that water in each flush, and then you have to continue testing the, prod, the containers and the piping over time to ensure that we've remediate, remediated the PFAS out adequately. The PFAS does self-assemble on the surfaces. Probably more important from what I'm seeing in some of the, the systems we're looking at is the nooks and crannies, the porous components of systems PFAS builds up in. So when we're looking at intricate piping systems, there's a lot of flushing that's got to take place and flushing piping is not easy to contain. There's and then we're looking at some sort of uh, safe environment and uh, safety cleans and companies like that where they're containing it and they're they're hauling it away for you. What they're doing with it from there is a little questionable right now. I'm not entirely sure I have solid answers on that. 
um, I have heard of, they are now allowed to incinerate it again. That was the preferred method of disposal of PFAS previously. Then it was banned for a while. My understanding is they can now incinerate again. And then I've seen deep well injection where they're, they're injecting this stuff way down underground and, and getting rid of it that way. I, I, again, I don't claim to be an environmental expert, but certainly there are com remediation companies out there that dispose of this. Uh, rebound is an issue, right? So if we, if we flush the system and we miss the nooks and crannies and we miss that the uh, calcification on surfaces or buildup on surfaces, you know, uh, continued testing is going to pick that up and we may need to do additional flushing. How clean is clean enough? Uh, that's an interesting question that I can't can't really give you a solid answer to, and it varies by state. It's probably discussions you're going to be having with the clients AHJ and the environmental divisions in each state or each jurisdiction. My name is Scott Golly, and feel free to reach out to me anytime with any questions. I'm certainly here to support you. Thank you.